Hey everybody, it's Mr. Smeeds. Welcome to APE's video notes for topic 7.4, which will cover atmospheric carbon dioxide and particulate matter. Our objective for the day is to be able to describe the natural sources of carbon dioxide and particulates in the atmosphere. And at the end of today's video, we'll practice the skill of describing a measure or a procedure or a variable used in a scientific experiment. So we'll start out today by taking a look at some natural sources of numerous different air pollutants, and then we'll get a little bit more specific and take a look at carbon dioxide and particulates. So first we should be aware that lightning strikes are a natural source of NOx, of nitrogen oxides in the atmosphere. So the energy from a lightning strike can convert uh, N2 gas that's very abundant in the atmosphere, remember 78%, into NO2 or NO, so nitrogen oxides. The next thing we should know is that forest fires are a major source of many different air pollutants. These would include carbon monoxide, particulate matter, NOx, as well as carbon dioxide. And we'll talk about that on the next slide. We need to know that they also release a lot of water vapor. Remember that water vapor is a greenhouse gas. It's not one we're necessarily concerned with regulating. It's really you know, a natural part of the hydrological cycle, but we should be aware that water vapor is released when there are forest fires. Plants are another source of natural air pollutants. A lot of the volatile organic compounds found in the atmosphere are actually emitted by plants, especially coniferous trees. So I mentioned this in 7.1 and in other sections of you know, Unit 7 so far, but think back to a time when you've been walking through a forest where you've smelled that really strong kind of pungent pine odor. Those are volatile organic compounds. And one class of volatile organic compounds commonly emitted by plants would be terpenes. And so the Smoky Mountains, one of our you know, most beautiful national parks, are actually a great example of natural photochemical smog. So these vox that are emitted by these trees are contributing to photochemical smog. And then finally, we have volcanoes. Volcanoes are one of the major sources of sulfur dioxide in the atmosphere, but they also release particulate matter. So think of the ash that they put out in the atmosphere. They also release carbon monoxide and nitrogen oxides, or NOx. Now we'll look a little more specifically at natural sources of carbon dioxide and particulate matter. So of course we need to know that respiration is a source of carbon dioxide. Now you want to be careful on FRQs. It's not generally considered like a major contributor to carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, but we do need to know that all living things, plants included, respire carbon dioxide. They release it into the atmosphere when they go through cellular respiration. And so this is important to be aware of and just to keep in mind. We also have a lot of natural particulate matter sources. This could be salt from the ocean. It could be pollen released by plants. We have forest fires, of course, that will release, you know, ash or soot. And then we even have dust. And so just soil that's picked up by the wind and carried around is an example of natural, you know, particulate matter. This leads to something called haze, which should not be confused with smog. So remember that photochemical smog is a very specific process that we learned about in depth in video 7.2, whereas haze is just kind of a general term referred to or used to refer to when there's low visibility due to a lot of particulate matter that's in the atmosphere. Next, we have aerobic decomposition. And so aerobic decomposition is going to be the breakdown of organic matter. So we have a tree here that's being decomposed, but it could be, you know, waste from an animal. It could be the dead body of an organism. And so it's going to be broken down by bacteria or microbes or decomposers like fungi or worms, and it's going to release carbon dioxide. Now, this is because there's oxygen present. So again, in aerobic respiration, we have oxygen present. And so that oxygen is going to be converted into carbon dioxide through this process of uh, decomposition with oxygen or aerobic decomposition. We want to contrast that with and understand the difference between anaerobic decomposition. So anaerobic decomposition is the breakdown of organic matter in the same process. It's going to be done by decomposers. But in this case, there is either very low oxygen levels or there's no oxygen. And so a bog or a marsh or a wetland, those are examples of places we have anaerobic decomposition. We also have anaerobic decomposition occurring as the permafrost melts and those puddles of water are leading to anaerobic conditions, you know, where that grass or that, that dead biomass is being broken down. So when we have low oxygen conditions and anaerobic respiration, we're going to produce methane rather than carbon dioxide. 
And if you want an easy kind of way to remember this, think about the oxygens. To produce carbon dioxide, of course, you need oxygen. And so if there's fewer you know, oxygen molecules available where there's decomposition happening, that carbon that's released will bond instead with hydrogen and we get methane or CH4. Now we'll go into a little more detail in terms of particulate matter and we'll talk about two different categories of particulate matter. First, we just wanna remember that particulate matter is a catch-all phrase that refers to any solid or liquid that's suspended in the air. Sometimes the phrase particles will just be used or particulates. And so we should know that these are kind of all interchangeable and that PM is the abbreviation that we use for this in apes. Next, we'll take a look at the different sizes of particulate matter. And so first we have PM10, which is going to be 10 micrometers or smaller. Sometimes you hear micrometers referred to as microns. These are kind of interchangeable units. And what we need to know about this is it could be things like uh, droplets of dust or pollen that are in the atmosphere. And we have a helpful visual here to help us kind of see what this looks like. So there's a human hair, which is 50 to 70 micrometers across. And so then we have, you know, in comparison, these little blue circles, which would be PM10 or particulate matter that is 10 micrometers or smaller. And so the reason that this is important is that these particulates or these pieces of matter are too small to be filtered out by the hairs in your nose or the cilia in your trachea, in your throat. And so that's going to be an issue because that means they can get into your respiratory tract. So they can get into your bronchioles or potentially into your lungs and they can cause damage. They can irritate the respiratory tract. They can make it inflamed. They can make it harder to breathe. And so that's why we're concerned when these particles get to 10 micrometers or smaller. We have another class that's PM 2.5, and this is gonna be 2.5 micrometers or smaller. And this is especially concerning because these particles can make it deeper into your lungs than PM10 or particulate matter of 10 micrometers or smaller. So the smaller the particles get, the more concerning they get because they just have an increased likelihood of penetrating deeper into your lungs and embedding in your lungs and impacting lung function. So many studies have linked increased exposure to PM2.5 to increased chronic bronchitis. So chronic bronchitis, bronchitis is where kind of throughout your lifetime, you're experiencing inflammation of your bronchioles. Again, it makes it harder to breathe. Uh, it causes heart problems. And it's also been linked to an increased risk of lung cancer. And so it can just generally degrade your lungs and your respiratory tract when you have these tiny particles making it into your lungs and embedding themselves there. And so this is why PM 2.5 is so concerning when we're talking about human health. So for practice FRQ 7.4 today, we're gonna to take a look at this experiment. And this is an experiment that is commonly done by AP Environmental Science students. So you may even have the chance to do this experiment with your class, or if you're one of my students, you'll definitely be doing this experiment. And so what we'll do is read through kind of the background and then we'll talk about the groups involved and try to figure out what is the dependent variable here. So here's the background. Students want to conduct an experiment to determine how road construction impacts the amount of particulate matter in the air. So they're going to spread Vaseline on the bottom of six Petri dishes, and they're going to place them at various distances from a road construction site and an existing road. So what I mean by this is a road that's currently being built, you know, so they're tearing up the old road and they're using bulldozers and, you know, steamrollers and everything to lay down new road versus an existing road. So this is a road that has traffic, it has cars traveling on it, but it's not under construction. And so the first three dishes are going to be placed 50, 100, and 200 yards from the road construction site. So the place where they are, you know, tearing up an old road and putting down a new one. The second group of dishes is going to be also placed 50, 100, and 200 yards, but from an existing road or an active road. So it's not a road that is under construction. So what I want you to do here is identify the control group used in this experiment. And then I want you to identify the likely dependent variable that these students are measuring. And then try to describe how might they actually go about measuring this dependent variable. 